All right, with our um, attendees trickling in, we'll go ahead and kick this off. Uh, welcome everybody to today's event. Um, my name is Sarah Beckham. I am the Associate Director of the Center for South Asia here at UW-Madison, and we are a Title VI National Resource Center. We administer public and K-12 outreach, the FLAS Awards, as well as the Annual Conference on South Asia and the South Asia Summer Language Institute. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and um, thank our sponsors for today's events. We have the IRIS NRC, ourselves, the Center for South Asia, and the International Studies major. At the Center for South Asia, we have a couple of final events coming up, and Andrea is going to post those in the chat. Uh, this week, we have our final lunch lecture series. Uh, Dorba Ghosh will be speaking at 12 p.m. This is a Zoom event on Thursday, December 9th. Uh, we also have an upcoming event from our artist in residence, Arun Lutra, that will happen this week, I believe, uh, tomorrow. Um, and it's Thala Mela, a celebration of the universal language of rhythm. And then finally, our panelists will be speaking a little bit about the FLAS Awards. We do just want to notify attendees of the upcoming FLAS info sessions as well as the deadlines. We'll talk about that a little bit more and feel free to ask more about that in the Q&A, but that will also, information about that will also be posted in the chat. Um, Couple of additional announcements. Essie Lenchner, who is our assistant director for the IRIS NRC, is going to be running the tech support for today's event. So if you have any challenges, use the chat function to contact her. We will be recording today's event and we're gonna share that link in a post event email. And you will only appear on the recording if your microphone is turned on to speak, should you choose to do so in the Q&A section. So with that, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. We have uh, Hannah Leiter and Dr. Vijay Lamai. Hannah Leiter completed her bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering at the University of Wisconsin in 2018. During her time here at UW, Hannah studied Hindi for three years with the support of two FLAS fellowships and a critical language scholarship. After graduation, Hannah received a Fulbright Award to pursue medical device research at Barefoot College a nonprofit in Rajasthan, India. Utilizing both her engineering skills and language proficiency, Hannah worked alongside community health workers to conduct a comparative study of hemoglobin measurement devices in the rural clinical setting. After returning from India, Hannah relocated to Atlanta where she now works with ventricular assist device patients at Emory Healthcare. She's broadly motivated by the challenge of addressing health disparities faced by vulnerable populations, and she hopes to have a greater impact in the future as a physician as she's currently applying for medical school. Our second panelist, Dr. Vijay Lamai, is a climate and health scientist in NRDC's science office. As an epidemiologist, he is broadly interested in addressing international environmental health challenges quantifying, communicating, and reducing the risks associated with climate change with a focus on the public health burdens of air pollution and extreme heat. At NRDC, he leads economic valuation work to demonstrate the significant health costs of climate change, and he works to defend the science that underpins the Clean Air Act. Prior to joining NRDC, he worked as a U.S. Environmental Protection Agency scientist focusing on Clean Air Act regulatory implementation, air quality monitoring policy, risk communication, and citizen science. Dr. Lamai, who also speaks Spanish and Hindi, has published several research studies on the health impacts of climate change triggered air pollution and extreme heat in the US and India. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and a PhD in environmental epidemiology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's also a former FLAS awardee here at the Center for South Asia, and of note, he has recently published in the Washington Post. So the format for today's event is we will have approximately 40 to 50 minutes of discussion from our panelists who will talk about how their international experiences and studies have helped them in their career pursuits. And followed by that, we will have a Q&A. So if you do have questions, please feel free to enter your questions in advance 
in the Q&A section, um, and we will get to those following our panelist discussion. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Lemay and Hannah Leiter. Great, should I dive in first or Hannah, you want it? You can go first. All I'll, right. I'll listen. Sounds good. Let me get this set up here. Okay. Can you see my screen? Looks good. All right. Great. Um, hi, everybody, and thank you for the introduction and for the chance to speak with you all today. Um, like Sarah said, I'm Vijay Lamai. I'm a UW Madison alum back in 2015. Um, and I'm going to spend my chunk of the time here talking a little bit about the work that I'm up to, especially internationally, um, and kind of weave in some lessons learned and hopefully um, a little bit of useful advice for all of you as you begin to think about global health careers um, and international training. Um, so first, I just wanna kind of start with how I got into this field. This is a picture actually I took way back in 2004 on my first trip to, to India. Um, a lot of you probably know if you've been reading the headlines lately that India is a country that's coping with some pretty extreme environmental and public health challenges. This was my first visit back to the country back in 2005, and it was really the experience of travel internationally to a developing country that got me to be intimately familiar with the huge challenges that we face in terms of global public health. So this first trip to India really kind of got me acquainted with the problem, but I found myself struggling to figure out ways in which I could try to work on the issue. So I was an undergraduate at that point, my school, the University of California, Berkeley, actually didn't have a public health major for undergraduates. So I decided to pursue training in environmental sciences. So I was really interested in trying to understand how the environment um, shaped human well-being. And so it was really through that first trip that got me kind of into this world. And um, I guess I kind of haven't looked back since then. I continue to do quite a bit of work in India, and I'll get to explain some of that later in my talk. Um, so in terms of training um, in international studies and how it relates to my career trajectory, I want to put a plug in right at the top of my talk for the phenomenal, really unparalleled opportunities that um, you all have as, as students to take advantage of, especially on the Madison campus, but also um, at other, other campuses if, if you're looking for a language that's not offered here. I stumbled into understanding about the SOSLI program, the South Asia Summer Language Institute, which um, was really a phenomenal way to have really focused, high quality training in a foreign language over a summer. So I was a PhD student, applied for the SOSLI program and was able to enroll in an um, intensive summer course really to get me up to speed and able to um, complete a year of academic training over the, the summer. So this program was instrumental in kind of motivating me to continue to, to do work um, in India. And I'll say that, you know, I think traveling to another country, any of you who've done that, you have, you know, I think a certain level of experience not being able to communicate in the language. But once you sort of dip your toes in the water and are able to understand the language, talk, read, enjoy the arts, music, film, um, you really get a deeper, richer understanding of a different country and its people, its culture. Um, and this certainly was the case for me. So I do want to put a, a plug in for foreign language study, because for me, it was really instrumental in helping to shape my career trajectory. Um, so I completed a year of academic uh, language study through SOSLI, then was fortunate, as Sarah mentioned, to receive a foreign language area studies award. Um, supported a year of my graduate training, and I continued to do a third year of Hindi training on the Madison campus. Um, so really, this is, a, I think, an underappreciated resource on, on the Madison campus. Certainly, the um, you know, internationally sort of run, renowned training opportunities that you have in foreign languages are something that I think a lot of people might take for granted, but they're really special to the campus. Um, I'll just mention that, you know, I think, um, in terms of, of global public health, of course, there's no shortage of, of problems to work on. And for me, um, one of the ways in which I sort of got acquainted with what issues really resonated with me was 
just reading the news. Um, this time of year, India commonly makes international headlines for really profound air pollution challenges, especially in the northern part of the country. And I'd say any of you who are interested in global public health, there's all sorts of reporting in national outlets, in country-specific outlets, on Twitter. There's all sorts of ways to get acquainted and up close with different public health challenges that you might be interested to work on. So I encourage you to kind of just stay on top of the news. It doesn't all have to be about reading about things in textbooks, but these issues very much connect to the here and now of what um, humanity is facing. And I'd argue that the climate crisis is going to affect probably every single public health challenge that we face globally right now. So whether or not you wanna work on climate change or not, I'd say it's probably a good idea to get acquainted with the basics of the climate problem, because in one way or another, it's going to affect the work that you do, even if you're not gonna work in global, uh, global health at all. Um, so I think another kind of underappreciated connection that I learned about as a graduate student was kind of the interrelationships between development and growth um, and sustainable development and environmental and public health challenges. India is, of course, a country that relies a lot on coal to power economic growth. It's doing um, a lot of kind of reliance on, on coal-fired power to lift people out of poverty. And so the challenge right now is to deal with these converging threats of needing to grow the economy, but also prevent the worst impacts of the climate crisis from coming to fruition. So to me, this was kind of an example of a really thorny, complex environmental health problem um, that could benefit from a different approach to things. You know, I think traditionally we've thought of global health as kind of the biomedical approach and a, a lot less focus on interdisciplinary questions like inter, like environmental policy and how that relates to the health and well-being of people around the world. So this to me was an interesting angle to get into and I spent a lot of my PhD work exploring the interconnections between coal-fired power plants, climate change, and its effect on air pollution and public health around the country of India. Um, just to like give you a, a quick uh, 101 on air pollution, a lot of the problem in India and really the most important air pollutant that we think about is called fine particulate matter. So this is a pollutant that we've really only been studying for about 25 years, but the more we study, the more we realize that it's supremely damaging to public health. Levels of this pollutant are tens, sometimes hundreds of times higher in places like India and across South Asia than the World Health Organization indicates are safe. And so we've really got our work cut out for us because part particles like this come from all sorts of combustion of solid fuels. Um, and so this is like some of the, the science that we're trying to translate in places like India to take advantage of what we've learned in Western Europe and the US in terms of epidemiology to understand and do a lot of uh, risk communication around the air pollution problem to make it resonate with people. Um, these particles are, are really damaging to people because they're really, really small. They're about 30, 1 30th the diameter of a human hair. Um, and so they're very small. They can penetrate past our body's natural defense mechanisms like coughing or sneezing or swallowing. They actually enter really deep into the bloodstream. And from there, they can inflict damage on nearly every organ system in the body. So there's a lot of health risk communication that's been developed um, in the United States by our environmental protection agency, for example. Um, but there's a lot less work on this front globally. And so part of my job has been to do some research translation in other languages, literally, to make the case that air pollution is a supreme threat to public health. Um, another kind of angle that I approach this problem is equity. We think a lot about kind of the average exposure to temperature or air pollution in different places around the planet. But it's really important to consider that these averages really don't reflect the human experience. And some people bear a disproportionate burden to environmental harms. Certainly, um, this relates to air pollution in terms of occupational exposures in a place like India. Rickshaw drivers are oftentimes spending hours on the roads exposed to super high levels of air pollution. Um, some recent research that I came across um, as a student at Madison showed that compared to the red line, which is where we might you know, expect the national limit on this pollution to be, rickshaw drivers shown um, in, that, in that black line are being exposed to really high levels of pollution. And so it's important to talk to those rickshaw drivers in the native tongue understand how their uh, job works, what they think of air pollution, whether they could benefit from certain protections, what kind of economic hardship they face in order to understand this, the problem and in order to shape solutions. Um, 
So I'll just transition from some of my, my work at UW into what I'm up to now. I work for a big international nonprofit environmental group called the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, we're based in the US, but we do a lot of work internationally in Latin America, Canada, and South Asia, um, as well as China. We work as kind of an interdisciplinary team of scientists, lawyers, and policy experts to advance environmental and health protections. I put a picture of my mentor, Kim Knowlton, here, um, just to, um, I guess, remind me of, of the need to look for mentors in your educational training. They may not be people, you know, that you are taking classes with. They might just be people that um, can, can lead you to a career path that's, that resonates with you. Um, and so professional mentorship, I think, has been really profoundly important in shaping my trajectory, and it's always a good idea to be on the lookout for people who can offer advice to you and help to shape your path. So our work at NRDC really connects um, public health to a bunch of different areas. We work um, across these kind of three bins, nature, communities, and climate and clean energy to work on environmental and health policy, both in the US and India. You can imagine that takes different forms depending on where you are. But to me, having interdisciplinary training and an ability to translate the science that I do across these different kind of bins has been really important for advancing my work. Um, I work a lot in kind of four key areas on the issue of climate change and public health. A ton of it is communication, which is where my foreign language training, especially in Hindi, but also in Spanish, has come in really useful. I'm routinely talking to news outlets, um, stakeholders, academics, other policymakers in um, settings to talk about the climate problem in terms of public health. So it's really been key to be able to communicate in these other languages. Um, I do a lot of individual kind of research on the problem and publishing, um, and so that's kind of another translational piece, but having the ability to shape those research projects on the ground with local stakeholder engagement has been really important for making the research useful for public policy. Um, we work a lot on the adaptation question in terms of how to prepare communities in India and elsewhere for climate hazards that we know are getting worse year by year. Um, and we do a lot of advocacy, especially talking to policymakers about what we think should be done and why more investment is needed to um, address the climate problem on both the emissions reduction side, as well as community preparedness. Um, I just wanna close by kind of giving you a, a case study of some of the work that I'm up to now. I work a lot in the Indian city of Ahmedabad in Western India. Um, this is a place that's on the list in terms of um, one of India's most polluted cities. And we've been working with local stakeholders to address the problem by improving their surveillance, their monitoring of the air pollution problems to activate a city level municipal response to address the problem and interpret it as a health challenge. So on the right side, I'm showing uh, what's called our on the uh, air plan, which is an air information and response plan, basically using new expanded monitoring of air pollution in the city to motivate further action. Um, below that is a research study, just kind of demonstrating the need to translate the work from um, the air plan into a research context so that other scientists can, can learn from it and adapt it to other settings. Um, India's air quality standards, I just wanted to put a, an example of the type of translational work. Um, we have a table here depicting what basically the national limits for air pollution are in India. This table really translates directly to one that our own Environmental Protection Agency here in the US publishes. And so it's been really interesting for me to understand the Clean Air Act in the US and what's called the Air Act in India to understand how we use science and, and the law to achieve reductions in air pollution and to understand how to kind of translate some of the air quality gains that we've made into the US um, into another setting like India. Um, I do a ton of, of public communication, as I mentioned, so I just wanted to give some examples of the type of, of work that's involved in, in global health in an international context. Um, we're working quite a bit to do health risk communication on the upper right, showing what the air pollution effects are on the human body. Um, studies, public polling in India indicate that few people generally understand the profound health risks associated with air pollution exposure. So we've been doing a ton of research um, and action on this kind of health risk communication piece. We're also all over social media, talking to students in terms of trying to build capacity for the next generation of environmental leaders that are gonna be faced with really unprecedented climate threats in the years to come. 
Um, I also just want to mention that, you know, working in public health is oftentimes about a lot of stakeholder engagement, working with community groups and needing to meet them where they are to shape research and action that meets their needs. And so on this front, the communication challenge and the need for training and local language capacity has been really profound. So I've firsthand really seen how my training in Hindi, for example, has allowed me to connect one-on-one -on -one with people who are interested in the climate problem, but haven't been part of the solution kind of formation process in, in years past. Um, I'll just also mention that there's, uh, I think increasingly a lot of focus from um, international institutions on um, trying to fund work in global health and the climate problem. And certainly um, students that are kind of equipped with already an understanding of these issues and their academic training as undergraduate or graduate students are well positioned for really great career growth in this area. This issue is not gonna go away. And finally, we've seen more support for action and policy relevant research on this front. So there's all sorts of opportunities that I can um, get into in Q&A if you'd like to chat more about that. Um, lastly, I'll just say that for a lot of people working in global health, I think it really comes down to a moral and ethical kind of passion. Um, this is a figure published by my advisor at Madison showing on the top that the countries that have been historically most responsible for carbon emissions are on the bottom, probably least likely to suffer harms um, in terms of public health related to the worsening climate crisis. So we really have countries like India and others especially African countries that have historically not caused the problem, but are poised to really suffer the worst effects of the climate crisis. So that's this kind of mismatch that really motivates a lot of my work. And I suspect it does for a lot of you too. Um, so with that, I'll just wrap up my remarks, share my contact info with you here, hand the microphone over to Hannah and look forward to Q&A with you all. Thanks. Okay, um, that was awesome. Um, I learned a lot from that, that was cool. Um, can you all see my screen okay? I'll just, okay, I think so. Um, so hi, my name is Hannah. Um, I graduated from UW in 2018. And after graduating, I went over to India and did a Fulbright research project, um, which I will definitely get into here. And since then, I've been working as a biomedical engineer at a major hospital in Atlanta. So I really want to focus on how I combined a lot of my language and cultural studies with my degree in biomedical engineering, um, and not just how the language and cultural studies have impacted my career, but in a lot of ways, how they've propelled my career. So I want to start off by sharing just the links and names of every scholarship and fellowship that I had as an undergrad, um, starting with the Bose Scholars Program. So this was the first program that took me to India when I was uh, just after my sophomore year. So unfortunately, I have to say that um, the Bose Program was discontinued with the pandemic, which is very sad. Um, but I do know they're actively working on trying to get this program reinstated. So there will not be a summer 2022 cohort, but check back for next summer because this program was awesome. Um, they help you find a lab in India and a mentor um, for a summer research project. So it's really a fantastic way to jump right in um, and get involved in the academic world in India. Um, and it's really a build your own experience. So if you have any interest in doing that next summer, just check back with the website and fingers crossed that this program can take flight again. Um, Sarah mentioned in my intro that I did a critical language scholarship. So this is uh, a program, I think they have it for like 15 different languages around the world. And it is really an incredible program. Um, it is very intensive. It's like, I think 10 weeks of language study abroad and you do different cultural experiences, um, field trips, things like that. Um, it was really an amazing experience. And then FLAS, of course, um, attend that info, info session that Sarah mentioned because FLAS was, FLAS enabled me to keep studying Hindi and to pursue all the cultural studies while I got funding for my degree. So um, do it if you have any inkling toward language, you will not regret it. Okay. Now I want to get into Fulbright. 
So if you're not familiar with what the Fulbright program is, um, I did the Fulbright Student Research Program. So there are some different um, categories of grants that Fulbright has, but I'm just gonna focus on what I did. So there are, I think over 150 countries that um, have affiliations to Fulbright. So step one is pick your country and then you have to pick a host institution within that country and you do have to find a mentor who's willing to support you. Um, you might already have project ideas or you might you know, have a professor that's, that has need for a researcher and is willing to write a project proposal with you. Um, but those are kind of the steps to curating your Fulbright application. Um, and if you have questions about this process too, I'm happy to answer those during the Q&A. Um, this cycle, the applications are closed, but if you have any interest in doing this after graduation, um, talk to me about it. You do have to have a bachelor's degree, so you can't do it um, in between college years. So I was a part of the 2018-2019 cohort, and my host institution was called the Barefoot College. Uh, despite being called Barefoot College, it's not a college, it's a nonprofit, and it's located in a rural area of Rajasthan called Bologna. And um, this was my, my team here that I worked with. So my project title was Development of a Hemoglobin Measurement Device for Rural Mobile Clinics. And I put the proper project title there because it did evolve throughout the course of um, my time there. And I'm gonna talk about how that happened. Um, but getting into the need for this project. So um, Barefoot College, the, the health department at Barefoot College takes care of very last mile villages that aren't covered by government um, healthcare schemes. So the type of patient that these healthcare workers see are you know, very vulnerable populations and largely it is um, focused on maternal and child health. So a huge health concern, um, oh, those are the field centers, sorry, forgot this slide, but those are the different villages that um, we take care of. So um, regarding the uh, maternal and child health, um, anemia is one of the, uh, biggest concerns that face this uh, population of people. So here are just some of the stats of how um, heavy the burden of anemia is, both in Asia and children and um, in reproductive age women. So you can imagine that monitoring hemoglobin levels is a really huge part of taking care of this patient population. So in the last mile rural clinical setting, um, a very common and rudimentary way of measuring hemoglobin is with something like this. So all it is is a finger prick of blood on a little strip of paper and then matching how dark red is the blood um, to get an estimate of the hemoglobin level. So it sounds like a pretty simple good idea until you see that um, they might not all look the same. So these were three different booklets, all the same brand that I found in our clinic. And as you can see, there is no consistency here. So a technique like this, while in theory is a good idea, was not giving good results and was really giving us an inaccurate picture of health for the patients we were taking care of. So um, my project was really geared toward um, creating a solution to this problem. Um, and trying to design and prototype a device that was going to be both um, appropriate for this setting and these users and these patients, um, but that was also accurate and was giving us good clinical information. So, um, so my initial approach to the project was kind of like I just said, I was you know, shadowing the healthcare workers, trying to get a good lay of the land um, and really understand the problems that they faced. And so I remember coming to this team meeting one day where we were all sharing updates about what we were working on and I was getting really excited about my project. Um, so I was excited to sort of share project plans for making a new device and I could feel in this room, it was me and all of our team of healthcare workers and my project mentor. And there was like no enthusiasm for my project and my mentor felt it too. And so she asked the team, someone tell me why Hannah is working on this project. Like, why are we building a new device? What's the purpose? And these, unfortunately, were some of the responses. She's making it because she wants to. And why build a new device when we already have so many and we don't know how good those are yet? So 
it was really devastating to hear these things, right? Because I got so excited about what I was doing. And here I entered this project thinking that on paper, I had all the skills to be successful, right? I had the language proficiency. I had the technical background. I had this prior experience in India, and I totally missed the mark on how I was approaching the problem. Um, so I think as, as devastating as it was to hear this, I'm so glad that I did because it was a huge reality check. And it led me to the most important lesson I learned during Fulbright, which is this that community members need to have ownership of a project for it to be successful. So when you are working in a cross-cultural space and you are the foreigner in a new space, it's so important that the local community believes in your project and owns your project. Because I just remember feeling after that meeting like, okay, so I'm working on this project and nobody here is excited about it. So I'm gonna leave. And then what impact really am I leaving behind? Um, so this was in theory, something I understood when I came into Fulbright, but something that I did not implement well at the beginning. So after that reality check, um, I really came back to focusing on this theme of ownership. And every next move that I made in my project, I tried to keep this as my central theme. How can I approach this problem, this part of the project and give it to a specific person so that the community itself is owning the project and believes in the project. So one way that I did this was by totally redesigning what we were doing. And that was, so this is my new project title, Comparative Analysis of Hemoglobin Measurement Devices for Rural Clinical Settings. So rather than build something new, I thought let's bring more existing devices onto the table here and let's see, let's see how these work in practice and let's compare all their different characteristics like how difficult are they to use how well do they compare with like a gold standard um, cbc machine in a hospital um, so this is what we did we set up a comparative study where we used all six of these devices and we used them across nine schools with 1200 kids and we got um, this huge project going and we got really the whole team involved, we got the teachers involved, um, and it turned into a really successful project. Um, so a huge part of how, or I'm gonna give you a couple examples of how I um, actively um, worked to give ownership to my team. So one of those ways was in learning how to use these new devices, I thought I can't be the expert on them, right? I want each healthcare worker to own one of these devices and be like our point person for troubleshooting things, um, getting strip refills and all of that stuff. So the second device on the right there was a newer, like more technical device. And to learn that one, uh, the company actually invited us for on-site training in Bangalore, which is a huge city very far away from the little village we were in in Rajasthan. So I thought, okay, how am I going to get you know, someone to volunteer to go do this with me, but uh, one of them did. So uh, the woman here who came with me, her name is Sharda. She was, she just killed this. She did so awesome. It was her first time on a plane. It was her first time leaving the state. Um, and she really took charge and learned the ins and outs of this device. And when we came back to the village, she was able to replicate this whole training for the rest of the team, which was very cool. And on the right, there she is using it at a school health camp. So this was a really successful measure of ensuring ownership in a specific person on the team. Another way that I tried to promote ownership was with the way that I was planning projects and planning health camps. So this is a flowchart of different stations at a health camp. And at the beginning of the project, I was doing stuff like typing up documents and creating, you know, like formal project plans. And I said, scrap that because I wanted it to be the whole team's plan and not just mine. So I brought sheets of paper to team meetings and we would write stuff down in Hindi and like pass the piece of paper around and point stuff out and take notes on it. Um, and it was such an easy way to get the whole team to speak up and voice their opinions about how they thought we should do things. Um, and add their notes. And then logistically, it was great too, because we would show up to a camp and everybody would feel like excited about it because they helped plan it and contributed their thoughts to it. So um, this was a really 
big change that I made that was successful. And then outside of just work stuff, I did a lot of things to just integrate with the community um, and build a sense of camaraderie and trust with the, with the local community that I was working in. So one way I did that was, um, you know, as a foreigner in a village, I got invited to people's homes for dinner a lot, which was wonderful. But at a certain point, I just felt like I'm not a guest anymore and I wanna invite people to my home and cook for them. So that's what's happening there on the left. And then um, I also joined a cricket team and I had no idea how to play cricket and it was an absolute blast. I learned on the fly and actually wasn't too bad. Um, but it was so much fun because some of the healthcare workers were on other teams in this league and we would play against each other and kind of joke about cricket and stuff like that. Um, so aside from work, you know, we had like actual personal relationships, which really helped establish our team dynamic. So um, all this to say, I want to tie it back to this point, because if you remember nothing else that I said, I hope that you remember this. I think this is um, the take home lesson from what I'm trying to communicate today. Um, but for me, as I reflect on Fulbright, um, my biggest takeaway from that in terms of my career path was that I knew for sure that I wanted to continue working with patients and being on the um, healthcare service side of things. I knew I couldn't come back to the US and like take a traditional um, like engineering job at a device firm. I knew that wasn't for me. So I started exploring how my current skills could be useful in like the patient facing side of healthcare. And so that's what led me to what I currently do, which is not global. And you can see that um, that top picture is the hospital I work at now, which looks nothing like that little village clinic I showed you at the beginning. Um, but what I do right now, I'm a cardiac device engineer. So the devices that I work with are called left ventricular assist devices or LVADs. And these are heart pumps. They're basically for people who have end stage heart failure and are too sick to wait on the heart transplant list or maybe they have some other reason that they're not a candidate for a heart transplant. Um, so this is a heart pump that is partially um, implanted in the chest, like you can see there. And then there's a cord that connects the pump in the chest to a bunch of external equipment that drives the pump. So the patient actually has like an exit site, we call it on their, in their belly, where this cord comes out. So this is a huge life change, as you can imagine. This is a device someone can go home and live for years with. So my role is very much on the patient and family education side of things. So um, when a patient is getting very sick, uh, I will meet with them and their family and I'll show them the equipment, the LVAD equipment, and we'll talk about how it works, how it supports them, um, what kind of lifestyle changes are entailed, and um, I'm there to support them all the way through until they have surgery and after surgery so that they go home like confident with taking care of their device. So how is any of this related to all the things I just talked about before? Well, in terms of like team dynamics and having ownership, I see that theme in my work every single day. As you can imagine, my patient population is very sick. These people have end stage heart failure. So it's not just doctors and nurses taking care of these patients. It's doctors, nurses, social workers, me, the engineer, um, a financial coordinator. I mean, there's so many players. We have a very multidisciplinary team. And the reason we're able to succeed and have you know, impact on our patients is because we all own our roles. Um, and so I see that theme prevailing all the time. Um, but as I reflect on my time at Emory here, I, it has really reaffirmed for me that I'm on the right path in terms of continuing to work with patients, um, which is why I decided to apply for medical school. So I'm currently in the application process right now, and I really hope that it goes well and I can start medical school um, next fall. So as a physician, though, I really see myself going back into the community health and global health space. I'm definitely learning a lot right now um, with my role with the LVAD program, um, but my passion really lies in um, healthcare for underserved populations, and that's, that's what motivates me. So um, just to wrap things up, I'm going to put this slide back up here with um, all of the, that program information, 
And then I just want to announce that Barefoot College, where I did my Fulbright, um, is looking for volunteers. So um, I don't know details about the projects, but I do know that the health department is looking for volunteers in the maternal and child health space. So if you have any interest in learning more about those projects or participating in them, you can email um, Dr. Mona Lisa Padi. She was my Fulbright mentor and she's the health department um, leader there at Barefoot. So reach out if you have any interest. Um, there are a lot of other departments at Barefoot, there's solar, there's water, there's education. So explore the website. And if you have interest in volunteering in other departments, um, you can reach out to them as well. They're always looking for volunteers. And that's all I have for you guys. Thank you so much, uh, Hannah and Dr. Lumai. Uh, we have, I have a couple of questions for you, but I really want our participants to have the opportunity to ask questions first. Um, so we have Natalia Betancourt asks, could you tell us about your experience finding a host institute, an academic mentor for your Fulbright project? And I'll throw onto that kind of an extended question since Hannah, you mentioned that, um, that Barefoot College is looking for volunteers. Uh, perhaps after you answer this, Vijay, if you could also talk about whether or not your organization has internships or other ways for people to get involved if they're interested. Okay. Yeah, um, so I'll start with uh, the host institution and uh, Fulbright question. So I found out about Barefoot College because when I did CLS, um, we did a field trip to Barefoot College. Um, so in 2016, I did the CLS program. It was a summer program in Jaipur, which is about a two hour bus ride from where Barefoot College is located. Um, so I just did like a day field trip there and was totally swept away by everything they were doing. And so when I started considering where I wanted to do my Fulbright, it was the first place I thought of. And so I just reached out to their general like volunteer at barefootcollege.org or whatever it was and told them who I was and what I had to offer. And then got connected with um, Dr. Padi, who ended up being my mentor. And this was just very like the stars aligning. But at the time that I emailed her, she was currently living in Milwaukee, like totally randomly. Her husband had a short term job placement there. Um, so we ended up meeting in person. Um, yeah, it was just crazy, but I think just starting to network and like going off of any leads that you have and shooting your shots. I mean, I just got lucky with how direct my connection was, but I know people from my cohort who shot out like 20 or 30 emails or maybe even more like looking to, looking to find the right host institution. Um, and I know Vijay mentioned earlier, like how important it is to find that good mentorship. And it's so true. I mean, I can't imagine how different my Fulbright experience would have been if I didn't have a good mentor. That was great, Hannah. Yeah, um, I think for us at NRDC, um, I, you know, I think you've, you've heard both of us kind of touch on the fact that global health, there's so many needs in this area. Um, we at NRDC routinely offer um, short-term positions, internships, as well as you know, career staff positions. Those are all on our, our website. Typically, there's a lot of summer opportunities, and those will kind of roll around on the website um, early in the new year. So keep an eye on that. I'd also encourage all of you to just, like Hannah said, you know, do as much networking as you can. You know, ask for informational interviews. There's um, oftentimes opportunities to support graduate students on campus who are doing international work and need some helping hands to take care of research tasks. Um, so I, I would say don't, don't be shy as you're pursuing these opportunities. Network as much as you can, like Hannah said. Um, don't be you know, afraid to attend a, a lecture that's maybe like not quite in your experience uh, or your, your area of study. If you just, you know, to get exposure in as much areas as possible while you're on campus, I think is really um, a huge benefit of being at a big, a big university. Yeah, I will say too, I was gonna say this earlier that when I did CLS, people in my cohort were like, you go to UW-Madison, you're so lucky because we really do have so many resources available to us in term in the language learning space and the cultural studies space. And so I didn't truly really appreciate that until I saw the way other people reacted to the fact that I was a student there. 
Thank you both. And um, for attendees, again, please feel free to throw your questions into the chat or the Q&A, or if you would like to raise your hand and ask to be unmuted, we can also do that. Um, so while we're sort of waiting for people to formulate their questions, We'll start with, um, you know, in today's competitive workforce, students often feel very pressured to devote their spare time to internships and other career related activities that are going to enhance their professional resume in a very concrete and direct way. Could you make the case for why your language study and regional expertise are equally critical for opp opportunities in global health careers? Yes. Um, so I spent two summers doing things not directly related to my degree at all. So I like this question. Um, and honestly, when, when I had all of this like Hindi language learning stuff on my resume and I'd go to an engineering career fair, there were definitely some booths where they were like not clear on what I was doing or what my direction was. Um, so I went through a lot of doubt with this for sure. Um, but I would say like, just because I did CLS, for example, I got connected with the, the institution where I ended up doing Fulbright. Like when you pursue, you know, a language study, you're going to connect with people who have an who have similar interests with you. Um, and not all of those people are like literature or, you know, arts or the things that you traditionally think of with language study. Um, there's a whole wide variety of reasons people learn languages. So just the networking that becomes available um, to you when you pursue language study is is really amazing, um, more amazing than um, like industry experiences that I had, honestly. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think um, language study and international exposure really sets you apart uh, in a super competitive job environment and, and graduate school environment. Um, I think, you know, showing that you have demonstrated kind of uh, commitment to language learning is really a, a nice thing for people interviewing you to see. Um, language study is all about, you know, being focused, being organized, being, you know, able to take risks, being creative, working with teams, getting exposure to all sorts of different students, maybe studying different things, like Hannah mentioned. Those skills are, you know, pretty much universally applicable, no matter what career path you choose. Um, but fortunately, you know, choosing those programs um, really helps to, to set you apart, you know, and, in addition to really enhancing the ultimate work that you're up to. And it's, you know, it's, all, it's not all about, you know, like, you know, working on your resume, right? Like Hannah mentioned, um, and hopefully I've, you know, relayed, this is also just about like enriching your own life, right? Understanding different perspectives. So many of these global health problems are super complicated. No single one size fits all approach works. And so this I think is a, a really powerful way to kind of shape your brain in a new way to approach these problems and kind of sustain you over the longer term. Thank you both. Um, we'll, we have a hand raised from Anna. Um, I see if you could ask Anna to unmute or give her permission, and then we'll go with our question from Molly after that. Um, hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd just like to say that both of your guys' careers are very like inspiring and very cool. Um, and the second question, I know you guys probably would have mentioned this if this were the case, but I was just wondering if you guys had any experience with the Peace Corps or like if you had any worker or like people who worked with you who were in the Peace Corps, if like if you've heard anything about kind of that path, I guess. And it's totally okay if not, I was just curious. Yeah, I don't I have, have any direct connection, so I'll let you talk first. <laughs> sure, sure. I have a, a few friends um, who were in my, my graduate school cohort who um, who completed Peace Corps um, between their undergraduate and graduate programs. Um, I think universally all of them had really positive things to say in terms of, again, getting really like kind of firsthand exposure to life in another country, but also helping them to shape where they wanted to head right after undergraduate um, training. You know, I think it's it can be a really powerful way to kind of give you some some useful perspective on on life in this country and what you know you might want to work on um, for for a career. I know UW has a really strong history with the Peace Corps, of course, and so there's you know 
probably hundreds, if not more people right on campus who've got experience with the program. Um, I'm happy to connect you with my friends, but I think there's, you know, all sorts of resources that, that um, are on campus to get more info on that. But I've, I've heard nothing but great things. Thank you so much. That was perfect. Thank you. Yes, the International Division has great Peace Corps advising if you are interested in that. Um, so we have uh, just a, another. Um, oh, great. Yes. And Essie actually put the information into the chat if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that. Um, I've got a question from Molly, which is very similar to a question that I want to ask. So I'll try to combine the two. Um, Molly asks, uh, is a career in global health something that requires a graduate degree? Are there ways to work in, in the field with just a bachelor's degree? What, the, what might those opportunities look like? And I'll kind of add to that question, which is, um, you know, both of you forged your own paths in a really unique way. Um, really, what kind of academic pathways are possible for careers in global health and what types of careers, to Molly's question, can people consider? Yeah, so I don't have a master's degree. I have a bachelor's degree um, and Fulbright was really, you just have to have a bachelor's degree to do Fulbright. Um, I actually, to do the specific kind of Fulbright I did, you cannot hold a PhD. So it's for people who um, are at the bachelor's level, um, between bachelor's and PhD level, I guess. Um, but actually within Barefoot, um, my mentor, Dr. Padi, is the only PhD on campus, I believe. Um, and everybody else is either local to that village or has a bachelor's degree and came in and is doing some kind of like project management or, um, you know, things, uh, other things, I guess. Um, but there's a lot of uh, project management and um, like fundraising type of things that people do on, at least I'm just thinking of barefoot things. Um, but outside of like hands-on biomedical stuff, there's a lot of like policy, which, um, you know, Vijay talked a lot about. Um, I don't know why I'm, I'm blanking on things right now. Device implementation is what I did. Um, but yeah, the list goes on epidemiology, more like research based stuff. So I think you can yeah. take a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we rely on a lot of um, research assistants um, in country, both in the US and internationally to, to work uh, to advance our, our research projects. A lot of them have bachelor's degrees. A lot of them get interested in the work and go on to graduate school, but a lot of them continue to work with us for years and years. Um, on campus, you know, it's hard to think of a career path that made, you know, that wouldn't sort of work well with global health. We have, you know, huge um, engineering challenges. There's engineers without borders. There's, of course, like big legal policy questions that I work a lot on. Um, there's profound kind of, um, of course, like, you know, medical science questions, but there's all sorts of undergraduate training in, you know, life science communication and English and, you know, all sorts of ways in which kind of the rhetoric of public health comes comes to play when the rubber hits the road. Um, and I think we're seeing that right now in this country, right? So um, I, I think, you know, keeping an open mind and not being afraid to kind of take risks. I took a very kind of non-linear path to end up where I did. It was a lot of trial and error, trying out different internships over the summer, you know, getting work experience um, was really my way of kind of figuring out what I liked. And I think um, there, there isn't enough kind of incentive to take risks, but I would encourage all of you to, to do that as much as you feel comfortable. Thank you. I'd like to go back. Um, you all talked about um, how studying the languages that are spoken by those communities you work with enhance the quality of your work and your research. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so with, with me at Barefoot, um, I probably communicated in Hindi 90% of the time. Um, my team specifically, because they were doing this work like with very last mile villages, like our home base in Filonia was considered big compared to like the last mile villages we worked in. Um, so it was absolutely everything for me. I could not have accomplished anything. Um, everything would have taken 20 times as long if I was trying to always have like an interpreter with me. I certainly wouldn't have been able to build the relationships that I did. Um, and have, you know, a sense of trust um, with my team. 
and build those personal relationships that I talked about. I learned how to play cricket in Hindi. Like none of those people, um, you know, could teach me anything in English. So it was, it was everything to me. I couldn't have done it without my language skills. Yeah, for sure. I think um, the the reaction I get when when I reply to someone in Hindi when I'm in India is is like it's really fun. I think it's like an act of kindness and generosity and humility to go to another country and you know demonstrate that you've taken considerable effort on your part to seriously invest in understanding a different place and its people and its unique context. Um, I think that is one of the most like profound things you can do in this field is kind of get away from, you know, a history of kind of looking to one part of the world as having all the answers, but really take this, you know, opportunity to work collaboratively, true collaboration um, and exchange is really powerful. And so to me, you know, language and uh, training has been, um, you know, instrumental in allowing that to happen and building those relationships that Hannah mentioned. Yeah, I totally agree that when, um, when nobody expects you to speak Hindi <laughs> and then and then you do, and the wall, it's like a wall comes down. I mean, yeah. it's not like that sense of trust is immediate, but there's a whole like preconceived notion that falls apart when um, you're able to communicate directly with people who don't expect it of you. Thank you both. Do we have any audience members who have any questions before I dive in and ask just a few more? All right, we'll give people a couple of minutes while I'm um, formulating some, some final questions. So this one is for you, Dr. Lamai. Um, as we mentioned in your introduction, uh, you completed a joint PhD and you specialize in the impact of climate change on global health. For those students who are interested in per, uh, pursuing careers in public health policy or public health research, what are some of the most pressing areas in global health that intersect with the research on climate change? Yeah, so, you know, the climate problem is pretty much the most important public health threat that we face because it affects pretty much every facet of our daily life. We know that changes in the earth system are affecting not just temperatures, but also sea level rise. And in you know, parts of India, South Asia, that's a really important challenge, as well as big kind of changes in the water cycle. So both extreme drought and extreme precipitation. So those effects, of course, have direct kind of bearing on the health of people in India and, and other developing countries around the world. Um, we know that South Asia is a part of the world that experiences some of the hottest temperatures ever recorded on the planet. Um, but I also, through my kind of training, take a step back and think about how that's affecting people and how the human kind of structures that we've built um, in terms of access to good jobs, good education to sanitation, how all of those things affect someone's vulnerability to a climate threat, right? And so this is why kind of working in, in global public health can be really challenging, but also really fulfilling because there's so much need to address structural inequities and international inequities in terms of how we shape daily life around the, around the planet and lift people out of poverty. Um, so we work you know, a lot on the heat issue in India because it's like a clear and present danger. And it's also work there that's very much informing the type of climate adaptation that needs to happen in the Western world, including in the United States. Some of the only research that's been done globally to evaluate um, heat adaptation planning has happened in India. And so I'm kind of, you know, really proud of the work over there because it's helping to shape the international conversation on this threat that we all face together. Thank you. And, um, you know, Hannah had mentioned the ways in which she found, was able to sort of forge her path. Um, can you talk about how uh, you found internships that eventually sort of led to your career or how students might be able to find them in your particular area? Yeah, um, so I mentioned the Bose program, which is discontinued, so sad. Um, but I learned about that because I was eavesdropping on a professor at class. Um, and he was talking about how they didn't have a lot of good applicants. And I was like, mm, maybe I could just drop an application in there. But it was actually really um, unintentional. I didn't have prior interest in India. I really just had interest in some kind of abroad experience while I was in college. 
um, and knew that I couldn't um, manage study abroad. It was just going to be too expensive and take up too much time and um, all of that. But I guess, you know, I learned about it from a professor who was originally from India. So if you have professors who are from other parts of the world, they're sure to have connections in other parts of the world. Um, and if they don't personally have projects going on, they almost certainly know people who do um, if they're from another place. So I would just encourage you to talk to your professors, especially those who are not from the US um, and see what kind of things they have going on in other countries, especially if it's a, a class that you're really interested in. Um, like the class for me was a, a biomedical engineering design class. So I knew that was something I was interested in and um, it was the right professor to kind of point me in the right direction, even though in my case, it was unintentional. <laughs> And Vijay, you also had some international internships, did you not? Yeah, in fact, um, I worked kind of uh, internationally through um, both um, the well opportunities uh, offered by the federal government. So I spent a summer actually at the U.S. State Department working on international um, environmental health topics. I was based um, in Washington, D.C., but then was able to build off of that working relationship and eventually go to Delhi and India and continue to work with partners there. Um, there's you know, a, a great um, kind of opportunity to work um, in, in policy, both in this country and in you know, other settings. I worked uh, another summer as a fellow in, in Vienna, Austria, working on the research side of things. Um, and so um, especially, you know, I think taking, you've probably heard both of us say that we, we took advantage of, of time, especially in the summer, um, to enrich our kind of career trajectories, to get exposure to different opportunities, to meet new potential future mentors. Um, that's really a great period. It's a, you know, short kind of window of time, but you can really accomplish some fantastic things and build new connections that will help guide you, you know, for years into the future. Excellent, thank you. We have a question from Yavi. What recommendations would you have for graduating seniors who are interested in doing global health work post-grad? Many of us weren't able to do any work abroad during time at UW because of the pandemic. So what ways can we still find those opportunities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think um, first just starting, you know, as, um, a UW Madison student, you already have this kind of natural link with all of the resources on campus. Those do not go away when you, you know, get your diploma. I'd encourage you to take advantage and understand, do a little research, understanding what people over in the medical school and the Department of Population Health Sciences, you know, really all over campus and the Nelson Institute where I did half of my degree. Um, there's all sorts of projects already underway, as Hannah mentioned, um, with UW Connections. And oftentimes those can you know, be really fruitful and benefit from people with undergraduate degrees. So I would encourage you to talk to people on campus before you graduate, um, take advantage as much as you can of networking opportunities, go on LinkedIn, go on Twitter, check out what issues people are talking about. Um, you know, I 10 years ago didn't have the opportunity to take advantage of some of the social media to understand what was happening day to day on some of these topics. And students now really have the ability to talk, you know, one on one with researchers and others working in global public health. So I, I'd encourage you to put yourself out there and be, you know, humble, but demonstrate your interest. And I'm sure you'll you'll find something. Yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing about taking advantage of, of the links that you get. Um, just through being a student at UW. Um, but I also want to say, like, you guys are tough because no one's had to do what you're doing before. And it's really hard for anybody who hasn't been through it, myself included, to really, like, give advice on how to navigate all of this. Because a lot of the opportunities um, that traditionally exist in this space have been disturbed, like the Bose program, like Fulbright. I don't even know what the timelines are right now, but I know that the 2020 cohort was certainly disturbed by it. So um yeah you guys are kind of the experts on this but like like he mentioned just taking advantage of the things on campus is really the best thing you can do um and then as far as social media goes like follow the nonprofits and the organizations that you're interested in because a lot of them will post when they're looking for volunteers or when they're looking to um you know fill a position i know barefoot college does you should follow them 
on all their social media pages because they always post when they're looking for people. Yeah, I think one kind of silver lining is that a lot of institutions, including mine, that were less comfortable with remote help from recent grads are a lot more open to it now just because we know that this need is going to continue. So don't be shy. That's really excellent guidance. Thank you both. Um, I've got one final question for Hannah before we wrap this up. And then of course, if anybody has any final questions, we've still got four minutes. So please feel free to jump in in the Q&A. Um, you know, Hannah, you studied biomedical engineering. You have a strong research background and then now you're planning to go into a career in medicine. You talked about how your Fulbright experience in India, um, you know, kind of prompted this change. So for those students who are interested in a, in a shift in their career focus, can you discuss um, how the knowledge and skills from your former studies in biomedical engineering and your Fulbright experience transfer to a complete change in your career? Yeah, um, so I, I kind of mentioned before that as far as like my specific transition, it was really motivated by just how much I loved working with our patients. Like I loved those health camp days way more than I loved sitting at my computer and sifting through data and, um, you know, doing more of the like research intensive tasks. Um, so I knew that I wanted to be more patient focused. And so that's how I ended up at my current job. When I took my job, I wasn't totally set on medical school. I was still kind of on the fence, understanding what a big undertaking that is. Um, so I just wanted to get more experience like working in the American healthcare scheme. Um, and a big skill that definitely transferred is just um, the ability to understand different people and their different backgrounds and to have empathy in those situations um, and to be a good listener. Like our, our patient population is so diverse and definitely my, my background working with um, vulnerable populations and different groups of people who are very different than myself has helped me learn how to be adaptable and, um, and just be a good listener and, and understand different people's circumstances. Um, you know, even though all of our patients have the same illness, none of them have the same path or the same resources or the same life circumstances. Um, and so just, I would say empathy and learning how to be adaptable are the two biggest skills that I carried through um, into what I'm doing right now. And I think our skills that I, I hope physicians have are being empathetic and um, adaptable. So I hope I can continue to build on those as I move forward. Great, thank you. Do either of you have any sort of closing remarks you'd like to add of any questions perhaps I didn't ask um, before <laughs> we close out? I My closing remark is study a language. <laughs> It's so worth it, do it, study a language, um, use your resources, all the things we already said, but it'll help you in any path that you're on. Yeah, agree. I agree, I, you won't regret it. I think it will uh, open doors that you didn't even know existed. Great. <laughs> Thank you both. So with that, um, before we end this session, I would just like to remind everyone that for all of the registered participants, SE Lunchner will send out a um, post-session video link for you that will also be posted on the IRIS NRC webpage. And if you could all, I'd like if you could all please help me thank both of our panelists for such a wonderful contribution today. Thank you.